Hey, welcome to Theology for Teens. My name is Nathan Lavalley. I'm so excited you clicked on this today because we're answering a number of great questions in this podcast. Is the Father the greatest of the three persons of the Trinity? Is God the Father to unbelievers and believers the Father in the same way? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Are all people made in the image of God? Can you do enough bad things that they stack up in such a way that you lose the fact that you're made in the image of God or you cover it up in some way? For example, did Hitler retain the fact that he was made in the image of God all the way to the end of his life despite the many atrocities that he committed? What is the significance of the Father sending the Son? Is there submission inside the Godhead? And finally, we're going to be exploring how the doctrine of God the Father impacts how we view the political cycle in America 2024 with Biden and Trump running for office. All this and more in this episode, it is going to be a gold mine of truth that you need for your relationship with God. Now, before we dive in, I do just want to ask that you would like, comment, and subscribe to this video or podcast. If you're on a podcast platform, leaving a five-star review, putting some text of how this podcast has been helpful to you would be really good. These things do a lot in getting this podcast into more people's pockets. Someone might click on the podcast and not see any reviews and go, I'm not going to listen to that. But if there's a review, they might go, I'm going to listen to that. So by doing these things, you fulfill your role as an online evangelist today. So do not be a passive Christian. Do not sit back and just watch content as a shadow viewer. Make sure to interact when you come across good Christian content online, not just mine, any good Christian content, interact with it. You fulfill your role as an online evangelist. Let's dive right into it. I'm going to start with a question. What does the word father mean in your eyes? For me, the word father means love, intimacy, relationship. It also means things like authority and discipline. Maybe to you, you have negative connotations. And when you think of the word father, you think of detached or distant or maybe even absent. All of these things create a spectrum for how we view and understand fathers through our earthly fathers. Now, despite where you land on the spectrum, I hope you can recognize that father is all about relationship. The word father is all about relationship, even if your relationship is bad, even if you choose a word such as absent to describe your relationship with your father, that is still a word that comments on the relationship. The relationship is absent. Father is all about relationship. Intrinsic in the very word father is the concept of relationship. And this is true of God the Father. There are four essential relationships that relate to God the Father, and these I think are the best ways to understand who God the Father is. Now, remember, we've discussed Jesus. We've discussed the Trinity. And so I'll just remind you, as we introduce God the Father, we are not introducing a new God. No, there's one being, God. But there are three persons. And so we've spoken about the Son, and now we're speaking about God the Father. This is the first person of the Trinity, actually, although we started with Jesus. And so we're going to be understanding the person of God the Father in this episode today and these four essential relationships. Now, I, I do want to tell you that the first three are really pretty simple to grasp. I think anyone could understand the first three. If I do a good job explaining them, I've tried to record this a bunch of times. Hopefully this one sticks. The fourth one is more difficult. It's more high level and there's a lot more mystery there. For example, there's going to be places I come to where I say, I don't know the answer to the question that I'm posing to you, but I hope that all of this builds up your relationship with God. And you can see there's work that needs to be done in the field of Christian studies. And um, that is what excites me about Christianity. One of the things, one of the reasons I created this channel was because I feel like there's work that needs to be done in understanding and explaining theology for and to teenagers. So let's do that work now. Let's dive into the first of the four essential relationships with God the Father. And it's this, God the Father is the father of creation. Now we're starting out broad. We're starting with the most broad and we're narrowing it down. The first one, he's the father of creation. We're going to take a look at two passages that will help us see this. The first one is Romans 11 verse 36. It says this, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. This is a passage that is speaking of the power and authority that God has. All things, all things is what it says in Romans eleven thirty six. Now we can look at another passage. And just a reminder here, uh, we've covered this in past episodes, but we are going to be utilizing scripture as our primary authority moving th- forward. We've, we've covered that. We might cover it more later. But there's going to be a lot of scripture in this video as we seek to understand the relationships of God the Father. Okay, second scripture we're going to look at, Ephesians 4, verse 6. Now, it's worth pointing out, this does come in a section that is speaking about believers, but it seems like 
it seems to me, I did some digging into this. Some people have different views on this on both sides, but it seems like the author zooms out here and makes comments that are more broad. Here's what it says. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And then it says in verse six, one God and father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So here we have comments about God, the father specifically. He's over all, through all, in all. Now, what does this mean? What does being through all mean? What does being in all mean? That's beyond the scope of this video. What I want you to see, though, is that he's the father of all. Okay, so here we have a very broad scope of a relationship. And this is the essence of this first relationship. He is the father of creation. Now, the first question we're going to ask for each relationship is this one. Who partakes in the relationship? Who partakes in the relationship of the father of creation? And it's pretty simple here. Everything that's created participates in this relationship. A rock participates. Animals participate. Humans participate. The earth, the moon, the galaxies, the universe participates. Electrons inside of atoms participate. And this is significant. Everything that's created participates in this relationship. Now, I am not saying that the moon and the earth are some type of personal being like you or me. That is not the point I'm making. The point is that because God, the Father, created all these things, they're all linked to him. They are connected to him for eternity as the creator of matter. Now, the second question we're going to ask for each of the relationships is what are the perks of this relationship? Now, I'll just point out, when you have a good relationship with God, the Father, when you have a good relationship with your earthly father, when you have a relationship in general, there are perks. Now, this isn't the best way to view relationships. We shouldn't view relationships through the lens of perks. I'm just in relationship for perks. That would be bad. But I have perks for being in relationship with my dad, with my father. The perks of that might be that if I call him and I have a pipe that burst, maybe he knows how to fix that and he can come over and fix the pipe. It just so happens that is actually not one of the strong points of my dad, not one of the perks I get from him. The perk I get from my father is I can call him with theological questions because he has a, a doctorate in in ministry. Um, and so I, I can ask all sorts of questions. That's a perk of being in relationship. And just like that perk, there are perks to being in various relationships with God the Father. The perk here is simple. It's existence. If you are in relationship with the Father of creation, meaning that you were created by him, that means you exist, and that is a perk. I'd rather exist than not exist. Um, and so each of the relationships has perks. Now, this is the most broad, right? Lots and lots of things fit inside this category. In fact, I can't think of anything that doesn't fit in this category. You'd have to find something that is uncreated. Our number is uncreated. We can get into interesting questions, but created things are in this category. They are in relationship with the Father. That is the first of the four relationships. Now, the second one narrows down a little bit more. God the Father is the father of image-bearing humans. That's the second essential relationship. He is the father of image-bearing humans. Let's take a look at Genesis 1, verse 26. After God creates everything, he gets to the epitome of creation. And it says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, to rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over all the earth itself and every creature that crawls upon it. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is incredible. First of all, we see the Trinity here. Let us make man in our image. Despite the fact that the author of Genesis would not have been able to articulate the doctrine of the Trinity, it comes out in the book of Genesis. And that's fascinating, this first person plural for God. Let us make man in our image. Now, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? That is a profound and important question. So let's just look at that for a moment. In the time that Genesis was written, there was a certain religious practice that we need to unpack to understand what it means to be made in the image of God. They worshiped lots of different gods. I, I put gods in quotes because they're not real gods. It's like the god of the sun or the god of this mountain or the god of this lake over here. Maybe there's a beast within the lake that's actually mentioned in Genesis that people worshiped as God. Well, Genesis says God created that beast, but they would worship these things as God, and they would set up temples or shrines to these gods. Now, the idea was that these temples were locations that the God could dwell, that God could dwell, and then inside that location, there would also be an image that would be set up to pay homage to that God. This might be 
a pole, a wooden pole that was carved in such a way. This might be a stack of rocks that is a certain uh, configuration. And the idea is that then people could go to this image that paid homage to the god in the temple, and they would be impacted in some form or fashion by that. And so we have this kind of four-part chain. It goes god, and then it goes to temple, and then it goes to image, and then it goes to impact. These were the four centerpieces of a lot of worship that was taking place in the time of Genesis. And right out of the gates, this is commented on. Because when humans are made in the image of God, it is as though they are the image that is set up in the temple. But it's of the true God. It's of Yahweh, the real true God that made everything, that made your gods, is what it says in Genesis. And the temple is the earth, the place that God can dwell. And the image that is set up in that temple is humanity. We pay homage to God. In other words, regardless of if you're atheist or Christian, regardless of your belief system, regardless of how old you are, if you're young or if you're elderly, the fact that you're made in the image of God means that when people look at you, they are seeing the Father. Now, I'm not saying that you are the Father. I'm not saying that you are God. In fact, they didn't believe that early on. They didn't believe that the idols that were set up were literally God. They believed they were representations of God that would help you view God and understand him more. And that is the case with humanity. When it says that you're made in the image of God, it is commentating on this system that was set up in the religions of the time. You pay homage to God. When people see you, they receive witness about God. And so the impact is simple. We impact people just by existing, just by being seen. The Majesty of humanity is an impact in and of itself. The evangelism of humanity, the good deeds that are done in different means and methods are all impacts because of the fact that we are made in the image of God. Now, who partakes in this relationship with God? Again, we're going to ask that first question. Well, who partakes are all people, all humans, men and women, people who are black, white, Mexican, Asian, disabled people, able-bodied people, immigrants, babies in the womb, humans participate in this relationship with God. And what are the perks of this relationship with God? Well, the perks are that you are valued. The perks are that you have an intrinsic value and it cannot be taken away. Now, I'll just pause here and make a comment to the question of whether Hitler covered up the fact that he was made in the image of God by his atrocities. No, he did not. Hitler did not lose the fact that he was made in the image of God. In fact, I'm going to take it a step further, and I'm going to say something really controversial. If Hitler had honestly repented at the end of his life, repented in a hard way, turning around from his actions, making recompense for his actions, saying sorry for his actions, putting his faith in God for his actions, I believe he would have been saved. And part of that is because you cannot lose the fact that you are made in the image of God. The perks are not just value, but the possibility of relationship with God. That is not something that a rock has in the same way that a human has. This is important. You have not lost your value. No matter what you've done, you have not lost your value. You might think you've done so much that you could never be forgiven, that you could never be loved, that your value has washed away. Your value has not washed away. You might have become really overweight and you look in the mirror and you see something you don't like. Guess what? Your value hasn't washed away. And it's because your value is not in things that this world says are your value. Your value is not in your image. It's not in your body. It's not in what you look like. It's not in your ability to produce. It's not in your grades. It's in none of that. Your value is in the fact that you are made in the image of God and you pay homage to the father who is far greater than you are. And that is one of the core truths of Christianity that we have lost in our culture today. Value for all. Now, I'm going to show you what I mean by the fact that we have lost this in our community today. In the 2024 political cycle, we have Trump and we have Biden, right? It's two not great options. In fact, two pretty bad options, I would say. Now, I don't know if you are a voter, if you're 18 and you're uh, voting, if you live in another country and you just think American politics are super weird. uh, I get that. But we're going to take a look at a video of Trump and a video of Biden where they both compromise on this doctrine of being made in the image of God and the value that that gives. And I'll give some comments on these after we watch it. Let's take a look. We'll start with Trump. When I'm reelected, we will begin, and we have no choice, the largest deportation operation in American history. In the largest deportation operation 
in America. Years, if you call them people, I don't know if you call them people. In some cases, they're not people, in my opinion. But these are animals, okay? You know, where people are coming from, they're animals. countries that you've never heard of. Talking about illegal immigrants. That nobody in this country speaks. We have languages that are like from, from the planet Mars. Nobody knows how to, you know, speak it. They're destroying our country. They're destroying the, the guts of our country. We're taking in people that are very, very sick with diseases that will be spread all over our nation. But we're going to start on day one with deportation. We have no idea who they are, but they are terrorists. And within moments of my inauguration, we will begin the largest deportation operation in American history. Our country is being poisoned. We're really being poisoned. They talk about the beautiful dream of migrants. It sounds so nice, you know, like in a fairy tale book. But some of these people are monsters, a big percentage of them. Why do you use some of them are like monsters? Vermin and poisoning of the blood. The press, as you know, immediately reacts to that by saying, well, that's the kind of language that Hitler and Mussolini used. Well, that's what they say. I didn't know that, but that's what they say. Uh, because our, our country is being poisoned. We have countries that, honestly, nobody have, has ever heard of. We have languages coming into our country. We don't have one instructor in our entire nation that can speak that language. Wow. Okay, I take major issue with a lot of that. The fact that Trump would say that illegal immigrants, in some cases, are not human. Guys, you need to understand that is a direct attack on this element of the doctrine of the Father. That God made humans in his image. We'll cover this more when we get to the doctrine of humanity. But I'm not okay with that. And you see, a lot of this is rhetoric. Maybe some of it would be opinions that you could hold. You could talk about illegal immigrants and, and deportation without compromising on your view of the doctrine of humanity and the doctrine of the father. But when you say that they're monsters, when you say they're not human, you're saying they don't have value. You're saying they don't participate in the second relationship. They only participate in the first relationship. That is not good. Like that is not okay. Now let's look at Biden. He does it in another way. Depending on your political leaning, you might have more issue with one or the other of these. I think they're both terrible. Let's look at it. Like most Americans, I believe Roe v. Wade got it right. I thank Vice President Harris for being an incredible leader, defending reproductive freedom, and so much more. Thank you. My predecessor came to office determined to see Roe v. Wade overturned. He's the reason it was overturned, and he brags about it. Look at the chaos. That has resulted. Join us tonight is Kate Cox, a wife and mother from Dallas. She's become pregnant again and had a fetus of a fatal condition. Her doctor told Kate fetus. that her own life Not a baby. and her ability to have children, a children in the future were at risk if she didn't act. Because Texas law banned her ability to act, Kate and her husband had to leave the state to get what she needed. What her family got through should have never happened as well, but it's happening in too many others. There are state laws banning the freedom to choose, criminalizing doctors, forcing survivors of rape and incest to leave their states to get the treatment they need. Many of you in this chamber and my predecessor are promising to pass a national ban on reproductive freedom. My God, what freedom else would you take away? Look. Okay, I'm going to pause it there. Because it goes on for a while. It's a fetus. It's not a human to Biden. It's a fetus. We're going to take away this freedom. Now, the thing that gets me about this is the blatant assumption that it's okay. Now, there's pretty much two issues here on, on the topic of abortion. I'm just going to very briefly go into this. Is an unborn baby a human? Do unborn babies have humanity? That's the first question. The second question is, are humans intrinsically value and have inalienable rights? If you answer yes to both those questions, then simply put, it's murder to, to kill an unborn baby. And Biden presents this as though it's a rights issue for the woman. And this is the way that the rhetoric gets put, put there for the Democratic Party. And so you have uh, Democrats and Republicans each appealing to different elements of the way that the doctrine of 
the imageness of humans is is being corrupted and twisted. And depending on your views, you might side with one or the other. Guys, this is terrible. It's awful. Who am I going to vote for? I don't know. It's not good. There's not a great option here. There's not a good option here. I don't like the fact that our leaders have compromised on this view of value for all, regardless of if you're an illegal immigrant or if you're an unborn baby in the womb, you have value. We should not refer to them as something other than human. They are human. They have value. I get really passionate about this because people are blind to one side or the other of these topics. I believe our Christianity would call us to not be blind on either of these, to both call out the atrocities of what Trump says when he says that illegal immigrants are not humans in some cases, that they're monsters, but also to call out the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party of saying that it's a woman's right to choose when we believe that humans have inalienable rights, are valuable, and that an unborn baby absolutely is a human. We have to call out the injustice on both sides of these issues, but Christians oftentimes seem blind to one side or the other, or they're able to explain away one side or the other. Make no mistake, if you do that, you compromise on the view that all humans are made in the image of God. Do not compromise on that view. The second relationship of God the Father has massive implications for how we understand the political cycle right now. Do not get pumped into the thought processes that they want you to get pumped into. Hold fast to your Christian faith this election cycle. That's the second relationship with the Father. He's the Father of image-bearing humans. Okay, sorry I got passionate there. This is just a topic that really gets me riled up. It seems like uh, I have to pull my hair out because people say crazy things that I know. Okay, let's go on to relationship number three. The Father of those united to the Son. God the Father is the Father of those united to the Son. What does this mean? Well, we're going to take a look at a passage that unpacks this really well. It's Galatians 4, verses 5 through 7. It says this. And we'll go back a little bit, get the context. But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, verse 5, to redeem those under the law that we might receive our adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of a son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, you are also an heir through God. What this passage is pointing out is that when we unite ourselves with the son, we get to share, we get to partake in the sonship relationship with the father. This means that men, women, again, any person Any person who puts their faith in Jesus are united with the Son, and they receive a number of different perks. So who partakes here? It's those who have put their faith in Jesus. And the scriptures tell us a variety of things about people who put their faith in Jesus. It tells us in Philippians 2, 1, that we receive encouragement. In Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Members of a holy body in Romans 12. In Ephesians 2, 6, he raises us up with Christ. Because Christ raised, we raise. We're united with him. We raise with him. We have who are baptized, have clothed ourselves with Christ. Galatians 3, 27, we're brought near. Ephesians 2, 13, we were far off, but we're brought near. When you are united with Christ, you enter into this third relationship, and it is the fact that the Father is the Father of those united to the Son. Now, do all humans participate in this relationship? No, all humans can participate in this relationship, but many choose not to. And church, we have a responsibility to bring this relationship to other people. That is the task of evangelism. We bring this to other people when we tell them about God. We encourage them to put their faith in Jesus. So that is the third relationship. Who partakes? People who believe. In the perks, you can make a laundry list from Scripture of what it means to be united with Christ, that you share not only his suffering, but you share in his victory, his resurrection as well. And so those are the first three. Now, I remind you, the first three are the simplest. It's easy to understand. There's this really broad one, all of creation, then all of humanity, then a subsection of humanity who chooses to unite themselves with the Son. And now we get to the most specific of all because it's the Father's relationship with one person. And it's this, the Father's relationship with God the Son. Now, this is where we get into a mysterious thing. I want to point out two broad ideas that are just very well attested throughout Scripture. The first one is this. When we search Christ the Son, we find just a huge number 
of passages that talk about Jesus saying that he is the son of God. What does that mean? Well, we're going to explore that idea. Uh, I, I just put up a list here of search results. If you want to look at any of these, you can. Um, a couple, like right at the beginning of Mark, Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. We have Second John 3, God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, John eleven twenty seven. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. This is all throughout the New Testament, all throughout Scripture. So this is the idea of Jesus being the Son of God of the Father. Now, you've probably heard that before. You may have never thought about what that means. Let's look at another search we could do. We could look at searches of the Father sending the Son. Here we uh, have a number of scriptures that would indicate this idea of the Father sending the Son. John 10, 36. What about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? 1 John 4. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son. Okay, so It wasn't just that Jesus decided on his own to go. It was that the Father sent the Son. So these two pieces of data are very, very well attested in Scripture. And it makes us search for a way of understanding these things. How can the Son, who is fully God, be the Son of the Father? And what does it mean that the Father was able to send the Son? And here we get into very, very specific language to show this. And if we're not careful, we can err on one side or the other and enter into a a heresy, a view that is just in blatant contradiction with what scripture presents. So here's the very specific language I found in the Lexham survey of theology. It says this, God the Father is the person of the Trinity who is the principle of the Son and the Holy Spirit, though having no principle himself. God the Father is the person of the Trinity who is the principle of the Son and the Holy Spirit, though having no principle himself. Now, principle here, we could kind of define that. It means the thing something comes out of. It does not mean the thing something is created from. It is not creation. It is emitting from something. It is coming from something. So the Son and the Holy Spirit come from the Father. They're not created by the Father. They are principled from the Father. That specific word is an important one. And the Father doesn't come from anywhere. He doesn't have any principle himself. Now, even here, we get into some dilemmas because these words are imperfect. Words get used, and when they get used, they slightly get redefined. And so, oftentimes, we say comes when we mean created, and uh, we say emits when we mean causally emits. That is not the case. The Father does not causally emit the Son and the Spirit. The Father does not cause the Son and the Holy Spirit to be in existence. It's that they naturally come out of him. It is in their very nature. Now, here we can bring in an analogy that in some ways is unhelpful for understanding the Trinity, but in other ways is helpful for understanding this concept of how the Son comes out of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes out of the father, and it's the sun analogy. So the actual physical sun, the ball of heat that is warming us right now on earth. The sun itself might be like the father. The light might be like the sun. Now, as soon as the sun existed, was there light coming from it? I think so. <laughs> you know, I'm not actually someone who studies the stars very deeply. Uh, and and the sun very deeply, but yeah, I mean, as soon as that light source was um, made available, when the sun was created, light immediately uh, was coming from it. Now, this is an imperfect analogy because you could trip into a place where you're saying, well, no, that means the sun is creating the light, and all analogies of the Trinity break down. The point would be this, just because the sun comes from the Father, just because the sun is the son of the Father, does not mean that the sun existed after the Father. Father and the Son have both existed for eternity past. You couldn't go back far enough to reach a point where the Father existed, but the Son didn't exist. Where the Father existed, but the Holy Spirit didn't exist. They have all always existed. But out of the Father comes the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are principled from him. Now, there are two boundaries that we need to be careful to not cross. The first boundary is that there is uh, no generation at all between the Father and the Son. In other words, you would say, "Eh, there might be some scriptures that talk about, you know, him being the Son and about the Father sending him and about 
um, the relationship between the father and the son, but it, you, you know, you can't really know. There's no generation between them. They're all just on a completely, um, you know, level playing field and always there's no distinctions at all between them. They're all, yeah, it's one, they're one. And here we would be stepping towards a oneness theology that would say there actually aren't really distinctions between the persons. That would not be a good thing. We don't want to go that way. We want to allow the persons to have distinctions And always we're asking, is this a matter of person or being? Is power a matter of person or being? Probably being. Is knowledge a matter of person or being? Probably person, although it could be both. So we want to allow there to be differences while being wise about what is not a difference between them. And so if we say there's no differences between them, we get into a place where we have overstepped a boundary of our understanding of the Godhead. We don't want to do that. We want to understand the Godhead in truth. Now, the other boundary would be to say... And and you could go several steps so really far that the son was created by the father. This would not be good. You go a little less far. You could say that the father has more power than the son. This also would not be good because it seems like power, authority, would be matters of being, not matters of person. So we've overstepped our boundary there. Now, we could come back just a little bit further and we could say the son has always been submitted ontologically, meaning in his very nature, has always been submitted to the father. Now, it seems to me that this would be a heresy. The reason for that, and this is unpacked really well by a scholar with the last name Bird, he talks about how if you believe in the eternal subordination of the Son, what you're saying is that the Son and the Father have a difference of opinion because inherent in the idea of submission is the idea of a difference of opinion. You don't submit to someone when you agree with them. That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. And so if the Son has eternally been submitted to the Father in nature, okay, not just in role, in nature, that would indicate that there is a distinction between their wills, between their desires, and that would be dangerous. Now we've jumped into different persons and different beings, and so that would be the fringe on the other side. So we kind of have a spectrum here, where on one side, you know, there's no generation between the father and the son. On the other side, the son has always been submitted to the father in nature, and these would these would both be places we don't want to overstep. Somewhere between those two is the truth of how the son comes out of the father. Now, we can ask some questions. Who participates in this relationship? Well, it's just the son and the father who participate in this relationship. We could ask another interesting question. Does the Holy Spirit somehow participate in this relationship? Is there a part of the relationship that's being related that is still intrinsic to the the person relationship? Does that seep into the relationship with the Holy Spirit? Here we're getting into lots of things. I don't know the answer to that question. But the big question mark is what is the benefit of being in this relationship? What benefit does the son have for being in relationship with the father? Now, it's easy to depict the opposite, to say the benefit that the father has of being in relationship with the son is that because the son assumed all of humanity, the father also can have an understanding of what we've been through. The father can also have an understanding of what it means to be human. Jesus wore humanity, and so the Godhead understands. The father can be a part of that understanding. But it's more difficult for me to pinpoint the opposite. What is the benefit that the son has of being in this special relationship with the father, of coming from the father, of being omitted, of being the principle of the father? I don't know. I simply don't know. I have some ideas. Maybe it's a difference in role that wouldn't be there otherwise that is beneficial in some way. Um, But... But I don't know. I would love if you would post your comments, actually, and give me some thoughts on what you think of that question. What is the benefit? What is the perk that the son has from the relationship with the father? Other than just community, other than just general things like that. What is the specific perk in that relationship? And there, that is the fourth and final key relationship that the father has. This has been Theology for Teens. I hope you understand a bit more about the father, that he is the father of all creation in a broad general sense. You're a part of that, that he is the father of all humanity who's been made in the image of him. You're a part of that. And he invites you to be a part of the third, to be united with the son. And that would be an invitation into a deeper relationship with the father that you may or may not have right now. I want to encourage you to really consider putting your faith in Jesus and entering into that relationship with God. It will bring about a lot. It's kind of cringy to say it this way, but a lot of perks, a lot of things will come to you in that. It's not a prosperity gospel. I'm not saying you will receive riches or that this life's going to be easy. In fact, this life oftentimes is very difficult and hard when you put your faith in God. But what I am saying is that you will inherit eternal life. You'll be raised up with Christ. You'll be a member of a holy body of the church. There'll be no condemnation. You'll be encouraged. You'll be brought near to God. All of these things are available to you 
as a person who can enter into this third relationship and share with the son in his relationship with the father. I hope this has been helpful for you. Thank you for watching. Talk to you in the next one.